this session. And as you know, we have a pretty binding time constraint. So uh, try to enforce the time uh, here. We have 25 minutes for each um, uh, paper and I'll give you a, a, a warning at uh, uh, 20 minutes. And we'll begin with Zheng Yang. And I, but I do want to clarify something. Is Fabrizio, are you on? I'm on. Okay. Can Fabrizio, you hear me? You yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Are you going to be doing the presentation? I'm here. I'm going to do it. I'm set. Okay. Patrick, excellent. Is there too. Excellent. Very good. Okay. Um, well, Zheng Yang, uh, please begin. Thank you, Larry. Thanks for inviting Thank us you. on the program. This is joint work with Arvind Trishnamasi and Hannah Lustig from Stanford University. And we are very excited to kick off this session on the international financial system by talking about dollar safety and the global financial cycle. Before I begin, uh, I'm experimenting with a new form of presenting. So I want to uh, respectfully ask everyone to switch their Zoom to the speaker view. And in this way, you should be able to see my profile picture, but this time it is going to be a combination of my slides and my profile. So in this paper, we're going to develop a model to interpret and think about several dollar facts that have been documented in the literature. First, we found the dollar has a convenience yield, which means safe dollar bonds have lower returns compared with safe foreign currency bonds especially from the perspectives of foreign investors. Second, the dollar is a dominant currency denomination for debt. There is a large quantity of dollar debt in the world outside relative to the wealth share of the US. Third, uh, the dollar follows a safety cycle. During global downturns, the dollar appreciates and the dollar bond prices rise. Some people also say the dollar is a safe currency for this reason. And fourth, following the work of Helene Ray and co-authors, as a literature documents that the US monetary policy has an outsized role in the macro outcomes for countries around the world. Fifth, the US enjoys an exorbitant privilege. The US external portfolio resembles a lever carry position, which longs risky foreign assets and short safe dollar debt. This lever position earns an exorbitant privilege, which also fuels the trade deficits in the US. And lastly, from an asset pricing perspective, the dollar is a risk factor, which prices and drives the cross-section of foreign currencies movements. In this paper, we develop a model that takes the first fact as given and tries to tie all the other facts together in a simple way. In doing so, we try to impute a central role to the dollar's convenience yield in the international financial system. In addition, our model also lays out a novel mechanism for transmission through which the US monetary policy affects the global economy. These two bullet points are going to be our major focus in this presentation. But our model additionally provides a resolution to the reserve currency paradox, which reconciles the goods market equilibrium with the financial equilibrium for exchange rates. And our model gives rise to a new form of Triffin's dilemma that we will talk about at the end, which is about the inherent instability of the current international monetary system. So to start, we want to present some evidence on the dollar's convenience yield which is our central assumption. In this figure, in the solid black line, we plot the treasury basis, defined as the one-year US foreign treasury spread minus the one-year currency for premium between US and an average of foreign developed countries. This treasury basis is a measure of the current covered interest rate parity violation when we take the treasury yields, both in the US and in the foreign country, as proxies for their interest rates. The figure suggests that the treasury basis has been largely negative for the past 10, 20 years, which means the US treasury earns a lower interest rate relative to the foreign treasury after we control for the currency risk 
by subtracting the currency for premium. In other words, the treasury-based cover interest rate parity is violated and suggests that the dollar has a lower interest rate after the exchange rate uh, risk premium is controlled for. This uh, convenience yield or funding premium is enjoyed not only by the US government, which issues the treasury debt. If we plot the LIBOR basis, which replaces the treasury yields by the LIBOR rates in both the US and the foreign countries, then we obtain the dashed blue line in this figure, which also suggests a negative basis and a dollar funding premium. Additionally, we can define a corporate basis between the US and foreign countries using corporate spreads. And the corporate basis calculated from Gordon Nail's work also suggests that dollar has a funding premium, especially for corporates uh, that are large, uh, issuing short maturity debt and have good credit ratings. In our paper with this model, we're going to take this funding premium of the US dollar as an assumption, and in particular, uh, as an assumption for the corporate's uh, funding decisions. And we're going to build a model to reconcile all the other facts about the dollar. Our model roughly have, has three blocks. To start, I will describe the block about the US. In this model, the time is discrete starting from zero. The US has a central bank that sets the nominal interest rate I, and the US households have overlapping generations. They only consume home goods for now. Later on, we will add foreign goods in terms of trade. The households can only consume when they are old. So for a household that is born at day T, they provide labor uh, with an upper limit of L bar when they are young at day T, and they consume when they are old. So their utility is the expected value of the consumption at date T plus one. In other words, this household is risk neutral. The US firms take in labor and capital to produce output. The productivity A uh, follows a process that is above one, and the production function is A times labor plus capital. In addition, we assume that capital can be costlessly converted into goods one for one and vice versa. The combination of these simplifying assumptions imply that the prices for goods, labor, and capital are all the same, and we use lowercase p to denote these price levels. In this way, we can track only one price level in this simplified model. In addition, the firms are run by managers with skirtler Kiyotaki structural preferences. In particular, these managers accumulate net worth NT and they face a constant rate of dying, which is sigma. When they die, they consume. So their utility is the expected value of, of net worth condition upon death. In addition, these managers also face a, a financial constraint that will be described below. But before describing that, uh, let me make the following plot to clarify the timing. So from the perspective of the US households, uh, for those that are born at time T, they provide labor at, at time T, and they save their wa wage in bond at time T. They only consume in the next period, time T plus one. That's when the bonds mature and the households realize their consumption. Now, from the perspective of the firms, they have to sink capital and labor into production at time T, but their output is realized at T plus one. This difference in timing between input and output necessitates them to borrow to pay for their factors like capital and workers. So indeed, they borrow at time T and at time T plus one as they have their outputs, they can repay their debt at time T plus one. The borrowing of the, the managers or the firms is constrained by the following financial friction. The managers can only borrow a certain amount 
that is capped by the nominal present value of the next period's output. You can think about this as a pledgeability constraint whereby the managers can only borrow a fixed fraction of their future revenues. In particular, the pledgeability parameter theta governs how much the firms can borrow as a function of their nominal present value of future output. And in this term, F is the real output in the next period. T is the price level, so their product is the nominal amount of the, the, the future output. We divide this nominal amount by the nominal interest rate to obtain the nominal present value evaluated at time t. This financial constraint allows us to obtain the following simple solution, whereby both borrowing and output are linear functions of the net worth of the managers. In addition, both borrowing and output are increasing in the pledgeability parameter as well as the productivity. So when there's more to pledge by having a higher productivity, or there is a less binding pledgeability constraint by having a higher theta, then both borrowing and output of the firms go up. Go up. On the other hand, both borrowing and output are decreasing in the real rate because a higher real rate decreases the nominal present value of the future cash flows. In this simple way, we connect output and the borrowing to, uh, to real and the nominal variables such as real rate, productivity, and borrowing constraint. Next, uh, we embed a very simple structure to talk about the real effects of monetary policy. In particular, we assume a simple form of one period price stickiness. So the firms have to set their price for time t plus one at the start of time t. After this price is set, the central bank sets a nominal rate i, uh, which is a function of a constant high bar and a shock epsilon, which we interpret as a monetary policy shock. Because the price cannot further adjust when this central bank target is set, then this nominal interest rate also translates into an impact on the real rate. In addition, uh, we have a structure for optimal price setting for firms that abstracts away from things like markups and monopolistic competition as in the new Keynesian models. In particular, we introduce an informal sector with lower productivity, but no financial constraint. We have uh, the details that describe this process in the paper. And what this does is to allow us to pin down the equilibrium inflation to be equal to the constant set in the central bank's monetary policy target. And in doing so, we have a simple way of price setting without invoking uh, richer structures. As a result, in equilibrium, we can describe the evolution of um, both the real outcomes and borrowing as functions of the central bank's monetary policy. The only equilibrium a state variable here is the manager's net worth n, which in equilibrium is going to be the same as the capital uh, in aggregate that is available in the US economy. With this description, we are ready to describe the impulse responses to the US monetary policy shock. We calibrate the model so that one period corresponds to one quarter in time, and we consider a purely transitory shock that raises the US nominal interest rate by 0.25% per quarter. Equivalently, this is a 1% interest rate shock uh, per annum that happens only within one quarter. Because prices are fixed ex ante, this one period shock does not impact the US price level, which means it has a real effect by raising the real interest rate in the US. This increase in the real rate then decreases the amount of borrowing available to the US firm sector, which further lowers the US output, employment, and capital. It is worth noting that this transitory shock that lasts for only one period has long lasting and persistent effects for these real outcomes because 
the manager's net worth or the capital is damaged by the shock. And the manager has a long way to climb back to the steady state and recover their net worth. And when this is happening, we obtain a persistent negative effect on the output and borrowing. And this summarizes our description of the US block, which is um, a simplifying or minimalistic mechanism to obtain a real effect of the US monetary policy. Now I want to move to the second block, which describes the world safe asset investors. Now we introduce a world good or a foreign good, which has a constant price of one at all dates. And the world interest rate associated with the good is uh, I star in normal terms and R star in real terms. In the, this block, there are risk neutral safe asset investors who derive convenience yields from holding dollar safe assets. We take this as a central assumption that drives all the results in this model. And in this model, the dollar safe assets are going to be only the dollar liquidity created and supplied by the US firms as described in the first US block. These safe asset investors give rise to the following Euler equation. So on the left-hand side, we have the foreign currency denominated expected return for holding the dollar bond from the perspective of the safe asset investors. It is going to be equal to the nominal interest rate in the US plus the expected exchange rate movement. On the right-hand side, we have the foreign currency return for holding the foreign bond which in normal terms is a normal interest rate I star. Importantly, the foreign safe asset investors derive additional utility from holding the US bond, thereby imputing a convenience yield for holding the, the US bond. So in equilibrium, the expected return from holding the US bond is going to be lambda lower than the interest for holding the foreign bond. In our other work, we iterate this equation forward and convert it in real terms. And we show that the real exchange rate is determined by the sum of expected future convenience yields on the, on the dollar bond, plus the sum of expected values of future US real rates minus the foreign real rates, plus a constant term for the steady state. In particular, the real exchange rate E goes up when the dollar appreciates. So this Euler equation implies that the dollar is stronger when the convenience yield for the dollar bond is higher or when the US real interest rate is higher. In this model, we further assume that the convenience yield lambda is decreasing in the quantity of dollar safe assets held by safe asset investors. In other words, lambda is now a function of the safe assets held by these investors with lambda prime being negative. So the more safe assets these investors hold, the more satiated they are, which lead to a lower convenience yield they impute to holding the US dollar safe assets. This then describes a financial determination of the exchange rates as well as the convenience yield. In this block, we will also add uh, the following component to facilitate trade between the US households and the world. We note that in the presence of the convenience yield, the return from holding the foreign assets is higher than the return from holding the US assets, also for the perspective of the US households. As a result, in a world in which they are unconstrained and risk neutral, they would like to do this infinitely much. To prevent from this extreme outcome, we introduce banks who intermediate cross-border capital flows. In particular, the US households do not participate in foreign markets. Instead, they can only sell their dollar bonds to these banks. This follows the spirit of uh, Quebec and Majoris financial intermediation of capital flows. In addition, the US households cannot short sell the dollar bonds to create additional liquidity in the US dollar denomination. For banks, they sell the bonds to the foreign safe asset investors and they invest the proceeds in foreign bonds. 
thereby earning the carry trade return as described here. Notably, this return is positive ex ante, but by investing in the carry trade, the banks also subject themselves to variations in the dollar exchange rate movement. In particular, ex post, the carry trade return is going to be affected by the dollar exchange rate movement, which could cause a capital loss for the banks who engage in the carry trade return. The banks then dissipate the profits or losses to their shareholders. And these shareholders can be the US households or the for foreigners who hold the equities issued by the banks. Lastly, the banks also face short sale constraint and they cannot sell more dollar bonds than they own. In doing so, we restrict the supply of the dollar bonds to those created by the US firms only. This is the quantity denoted by Q, which is the equilibrium amount of dollar liquidity traded and held by the world investors. Lastly, we note that the dollar debt market would clear by matching the liquidity supplied by the US firms and intermediate by the banks with the demand from this, U this world safe asset investors. With this, um, we can describe the full determination of exchange rates and convenience yields as functions of the dollar liquidity. The last element we're going to add in this second world block is to think about trade. As promised above, we're now replacing the US households to allow them to consume both home goods and foreign goods. In particular, the US households have log utility over home goods and foreign goods weighted by parameters alpha H and alpha T. Additionally, the US households also have preference over bequest to the next generation, which allows us to capture the transfer from one US household to their next generation. The bequest is held and stored in the bank's equity. It's four, which minutes, means, four, four minutes, Jane. Four minutes. Four minutes. Got it. Thank you. Which means that the household budget uh, is going to be determined by their labor income and the bequest from the last generation. With all this, um, with all these structures, we can now continue to describe the US policy shocks uh, response and the responses for different sectors. As with above, we have the US normal interest rates going up. And as a response, the US outputs and dollar liquidity goes down. Now, this US monetary policy shock raises the convenience yield and the dollar exchange rate. As a result, the bank carry trade crashes because the dollar appreciates. But the carry trade profits is, are expected to go up in the future as the future convenience yields are higher. If we look at the bank equity value, which is the present expected value of future carry profits, in foreign currency terms, they actually go up because the convenience yields are expected to go up in the future. Lastly, the US trade balance is going to be higher uh, or going to, there is going to be less trade deficit in the US because it mirrors the movements in the profits to the US households. As the carry trade crashes, the bank carry profits goes down and the US trade balance goes closer to zero. For the remainder of my presentation, I would like to make a few points about the international monetary equilibrium. Um, first, in these impulse responses, we show that the US balance sheet behaves as per grandchild Ray and uh, Gobilot. In particular, the US takes a short position on safe dollar bond and a long position in risky foreign assets. In doing so, they earn an exorbitant privilege, which is a positive safe uh, carry trade income that fuels a persistent trade deficit in the US. However, during recessions, as dollar appreciates, the carry trade crashes and the bank faces losses, which leads to a reduction in the trade deficit. The key innovation in our paper relative to the prior literature is to drive this asymmetry by convenience yield instead of by the currency risk premium. The latter is a standard story in the literature, which gives rise to the reserve currency puzzle as per majority 2017. 
And here is how this puzzle arises. Since the US takes a risky position and earns the exorbitant privilege, according to the risk premium story, the US basically provides insurance to the rest of the world. So in recessions, the US transfers wealth to the rest of the world as an insurance payment to the extent that there's home bias towards consuming domestic goods, the foreigners with higher relative wealth will drive higher demand for foreign goods leading to foreign exchange rate appreciation in real terms. However, in the data, the dollar appreciates in recessions, which gives rise to this puzzle. This highlights a tension between the risk-based wealth transfer during recessions versus the flight to dollar, which drives dollar appreciation. In our paper, we provide a, a resolution to this puzzle by emphasizing the role of convenience yields and a valuation channel. When convenience yield rises in a crisis, this actually raises the valuation of future carry trades, which benefit the US households. This leads to a wealth effect because the US gets richer by the revaluation of their future exorbitant privilege generated by the future convenience yields. And as a result, we can generate the dollar appreciation during crisis while maintaining uh, the, the, the goods market clear, clearing and the wealth transfer uh, in this convenience yield story. Importantly, this is distinct from the risk premium story and could generate this resolution for the reserve currency paradox. Um, do, I, do I have one more minute or I'm done here? I think uh, yeah, if you could wrap it up. Okay, uh, let me have one more minute and wrap up. Uh, so um, the second block, as I described, gives rise to an international equilibrium in which the convenience yield drives both the trade dynamics as well as the exchange rate movements in the US uh, against the foreign countries that resolve some of the puzzles we have in the past. Once we bring in the foreign country block, which mirrors the US block, we can further show that the US shocks spill over to the foreign countries, whereas the foreign shocks do not spill over back to the US. In addition, there's a contagion, which means one foreign country's shock impacts the supply of safe dollar debt uh, in the global equilibrium, which spills over to another foreign countries. In doing so, the dollar arises as a global risk factor affecting all the foreign countries. And I'll stop here by saying that we have a model that imputes a central role to the dollar as safe assets, which we take as primitive. We provide a resolution to all this interesting phenomenon documented about the specialness of the US dollar and the US in the international uh, monetary system. And in addition, we provide a resolution to the reserve currency paradox. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yang. Um, Fabrizio, um, or Pat, or? Here we are, you ready? Yeah, yeah. You see my yeah. screen? Yeah, uh, it's not in presentation mode. If you, no, I like uh, it this I'll, way, that's okay. Oh, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. That's okay, I like it this way so I can, uh, I'll do it like that, so I can write on the slides. Thank you. This is World Financial Cycles, joined with Yen from Rochester, Pierre from Cleveland, and Fabrizio from Minneapolis Fed. So our goal is to understand a cross-section of spreads in emerging markets. Now, the standard sovereign debt model, familiar from Ariano, Eaton, Gersovitz, et cetera, output growth drives the spreads. Empirically, there's a volatile and common component to spreads across the emerging markets. In some sense, is a world financial cycle that drives this emerging market bond spreads. But that standard common model we all teach is a puzzle because the output growth isn't very correlated, much less correlated than the spreads, and it's hard to explain. What drives this world financial cycle, by which I mean this common component of spreads? Well, is it emerging country shocks? Is it the quantity of risk in the South? common shocks in emerging countries, or is it that the North is a common lender to all these Southern guys, and something's happened in the North, and that spreads through the North's problems down to the South, say through their banks. So we're going to develop a quantitative model of this cycle, and we're going to allow for shocks both in the quantity in the South 
And in the price of risk in the north, then we're going to use real and financial data to identify the importance of each. And it's going to be relevant for the debate on financial spillovers in the north and in the south. We're going to have a large patient north country. Think of it as US and Europe combined. Many impatient southern small open economies. We're going to have incomplete financial markets. The only thing traded across countries is going to be uncontingent long-term bonds with default risk. Now, the spreads are going to be affected by growth rates independent across the South, as in Chris uh, Ariano's model. But we're going to also have shocks in the long-run growth prospects and volatility correlated across the South, which is new to this class of models, and shocks to long-run growth prospects and volatility in the North, which is new to the default models, but very common from Bonsall-Yaron type models. All countries are going to be risk averse with Epstein's end preferences. The key idea is going to be the common component of Southern spreads is going to increase when the long-run growth prospects a correlated component of get that across the South falls or the long run growth prospects of the North fall and it spreads and it comes through the North effect in the South or world volatility shocks increase. Now, importantly, the long run growth prospects of the South can be correlated with this common long run component without output itself being very correlated because if it were, you'd contradict the data because it's not very correlated. Likewise, the volatility in the North and the South can be very correlated, but output across the South or between the North and the South is not very correlated. Otherwise, you contradict the data. So identification is going to use the model very seriously and the data from the North and the South stock markets, growth rates, and spreads to infer back the time series of these underlying shocks, which are driving everything. I'm going to do the data in the model and I'll show the model can match in a moment sense uh, many features of the data. And then the key analysis is going to break the, I'm going to break the uh, analysis into three periods. The crisis period, 1898, we have high spreads and booming north stock market. This middle period, we have declining spreads and stable North market, we call it the great spread moderation. And then the great recession, of course, we have a spike in the spreads and a collapse. We're going to use the backed out pattern of shocks to evaluate the drivers. And they're going to differ a little bit between these. Our data is going to be 23 emerging countries with the late 15 years of monthly spread data. And it's similar data to Longstaff and Singleton and Agar and company in their handbook. Now, there's three regularities that are hard to explain with standard Ariano type models. Spreads are much higher than default frequencies. And, and there's a high volatility of the spreads. And this is a big one. Across emerging markets, spreads co move much more than output or output growth. Let me tell you a little bit about that. In the data, average spreads are about 4.8%, mean across southern countries we looked at. But the default frequency is only about two. So you need to go from two to four, and you need a lot of risk aversion uh, to get that. Or else if you had not so much or CRA, you get two here and you get about two and a little bit here. You'd never get it up to four. And this is even harder to get a two per percentage point standard deviation of spreads. So intuitively think of spreads varying between 2.7 and 6.9 in a one standard deviation up and down. This Almost no model I know gets this. Now, I'm going to show you in this next picture that the average correlation of spreads is 61% across southern countries, but the average correlation of growth rates is only about, about a third as much, way less. So that's why if you use a simple model, you can't get this to explain this. So here's a picture. These are pairwise correlations. The blues are pairwise correlations of growth rates across pairs of countries. And what you see is on average, it's about 24. And this is a histogram of the pairwise correlations and they're hanging around this two, 2.4. If you look at the pairwise correlation of spreads, you uniformly see that they're all shifted to the right. And so they're all way over here. And so in emerging markets, there's much stronger co-movement and spreads in GDP. All emerging markets have all positive co-movements. Every single one of these yellow bars is positive and output growths are just not very correlated. That's why the standard model cannot get this picture. It will get the yellow and the blue dead on top of each other. 
you put in correlated growth rates, you get out correlated spreads, that's it. You can't get this separation like that. It's our model. One north, continuum of small southern guys. One good, no, no real exchange rate effects, anything like that. The south is going to be impatient. They're going to have a lower discount factor. Everyone's going to have Epstein's in preferences. And we're going to have theta for risk aversion and one over gamma for IES. So we can have them be pretty risk averse without interfering with their intertemporal substitution. And we're going to follow a lot. If you're familiar with Bonsall or your own long run risk, we're basically taking Bonsall your own long run risk embedded into a world into an Ariano type model is the gist of what we're doing with a little bit of general equilibrium because there's borrowing and lending going on. The endowment processes, the individual countries growth rate chapter independent across countries. Uh, we're going to have persistent long run risks, which are correlated so that here's the uh, growth rate shocks in the north and in the south. And these are <coughs> IAD. We're going to have persistent long run risk shocks, which is a very persistent component to the growth rate as in bonds are your own. Think of this row as being very high, 0.99 in the growth rates. And we're going to have volatility shocks, which are perfectly correlated across countries. And the volatility shocks in red are going to affect every single shock in the economy. So this is world volatility shock. OK, so we have own growth rate shocks, persistent long run risk shocks, and we have world volatility shocks. And we have common, it's all symmetric. So the correlations across the south are all symmetric. We're not fitting individual countries. We have common components. Asset markets, the South is going to borrow from the North. We're going to have integrated long-term bond markets. South's going to borrow from the North and going to critically, of course, have defaultable, uncontingent debt. South is impatient, so it always wants to borrow. But they're going to face these upward sloping schedules because of default risk. The Northerners price in the default risk, of course. This can be limited risk sharing because you can borrow and lend, but these are uncontingent, so there's no insurance. We're going to, for simplicity, have segmented stock markets. The northerners hold all the north. The southerners, each southern country holds its own stocks. <clears throat> and why? Because the pricing of stocks gives information about the shocks. But there's no impact of these on real allocations because of Lucas logic. Now, why these frictions? Well, the frictionless holding of stocks, we tried that. You have way too much risk sharing. And you get counterfactual implications in terms of consumption, et cetera. So we went to the extreme for now. We're going to focus on the complete segmentation. Each southern guy holds their own. Each northern guy holds its own. Now, stocks, we have segmented stocks. Stocks are claims to risky country-specific dividend streams. And the dividends in a given country like Mexico load on Mexicans' long-run risk and world volatility. So here's the north. It loads on the north long-run risk and north volatility. And in a country, say Mexico, it loads on Mexicans' long-run risk and, Mex and world volatility. And there's some correlation. And the main purpose, this is going to give us a critical piece of information to sort out how much is long run growth prospects doing versus volatility. So we need these all. We couldn't identify anything. How about debt and default? The South borrows because of impatient. And it borrows more, of course, when it has good growth prospects. Now we have long term debt. And we follow the literature like uh, Chatterjee and company. And we have a coupon with this decaying at a certain rate. So if you borrow one, then you pay 0 0.9, 0 0.9 squared, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we choose this to match the average maturity. If you have short-term bonds, it's well known you can't get any reasonable debt output ratios. You need long-term bonds. But it also makes computing the model way more complicated. Now, default, as in Ariano, leads to temporary financial autarky. So if you default, you're kicked out. You can't borrow lend for until you stochastically get back in. And during the period you're kicked out, your output exogenously goes down. OK, how much? This is your output absent any penalties. And this is like a penalty function, which is going to say less than one when you're kicked out. And when are you going to be? What's the penalty? The penalty is going to be default costs are going to be low when your growth prospects are low. And as an Ariano, that's going to tend to make the people default when they're situation is bad. And that's critical. You need something like that to get the people to default in bad times. <clears throat> and you're excluded from financial markets and you re-enter with probability lambda. So those are the two things. You get kicked out 
from any borrowing and lending, and while you're kicked out, your output is exogenously lower, according to this function. We're going to scale the variables in the south to make it uh, by, by your own country growth rate to make it stationary. So the budget constraint is simple. The only thing the south is doing is doing a, a defaultable bond, and <clears throat> this is a long-term bond that's going to do that decaying payments. And once you scale it, here's the budget constraint. And this is stationary. In the South, the state variables are the debt, scaled debt, and this kappa, which is a stochastic shock to how much the penalty uh, affects you, which is makes it much easier to compute. I can explain that in the extra section, which by the way, I'll stick in the chat in, in a bit. So you have inherited debt and a cost of default, and the aggregate states are X, XN, XI, which is really XSI, which is your personal state and sigma. You don't need to know the other southern country state because this is all, everyone's small. So you only need the north and you yourself and the other XSs are sitting over there, but they don't interact with the equilibrium because they're all small economies. Each southern guy, I drop the eyes, at the beginning of the period chooses to default or not based on their state. So they can either repay or they can default. <coughs> Defaulting, one means repay, zero means default. And I need this decision in a minute for the Northerners. So the default value is just, if you default, it's simple. You're just eating this uh, penalized endowment and you can't borrow and lend, you can't do anything. So you're just sitting there and you do that when you're in default. And then with probability lambda, you get forgiven, so to speak. You come back in and you start with zero debt, just like in Ariano. And then you start again borrowing and doing your thing. So that's the default value. The repaying value is just, you just borrow. You just you keep, keep borrowing and you have this value. Now, critically, when you borrow, this is your schedule. You are not facing a fixed bond price. You're fixing a schedule. And that's the bond price schedule faced by the South, determined by the North, that I'll explain in a minute. So in particular, if you ask for a lot more money and you're the South, you're paying a worse rate because they personally think you're going to default more and that's priced into it. And so that's what the North is doing, delivering this bond price schedule that makes you face an upward close pricing interest rate or your bond, your bonds that you, the value you get for your bonds goes down the more you borrow and your shocks and everything else. The North is simply straight bonds all your own because it's effectively from them a closed economy. This is straight bonds all your own, Epstein's in with long run risk and you get a normal safe discount factor in the North that depends on the North's consumption and the North's uh, expected values. Now they price the long-term bonds. So the Northerners are sitting there with this kernel and they say, how do I price this long-term bond? Well, what, it is, what is this Southerner this particular southerner I'm lending to going to do to me next period. And that affects the effective dividends you get. If they default, you get nothing. If they don't default, it keeps going. And this is just a recursive way to price in that southerner thinking through all that logic for all the north. The south is small. And so we can just solve for the north independently of the south. So this is not just C in the North, this is their Y because nothing the South does affects the North. That's what makes it simple. So C is Y. So this is literally bond sell your own. And we're just using it to price the Southern debt. So each Southern country is a small open economy with some lenders where there's a correlation between the North discount factor and the Southern payments on debt because the X's and the Sigma's are correlated. And so it makes the Southern default debt choice and default correspond to when the North shocks are happening. And so, so it's risky from the point of view to North because they're correlated. Okay, now we're gonna choose parameters to match a bunch of real and financial moments. I'm just gonna jump to the bottom line of what the it looks like if this setup is clear. Basically the North sitting there just pricing things, not doing anything else, but they have correlated shocks with the South and it's thinking through those Southerners are gonna default on me sometimes when I don't want them to default and they charge a risk premium because of that, because the shocks are correlated. That's the gist of it. Now here are the statistics. We picked, there's two sets of statistics. There's some real statistics on growth rates, et cetera. And we try to hit those. That's one part of the discipline. We have some interest rates. We hit the mean spread, standard deviation of spreads, we hit the default rates, risk-free rates, and we, and we 
try to hit the correlations. We're a little bit too high right now. We turned up the correlation a little bit too high, this 79, and we're working on that. But the model can get high spreads, four versus the, four versus the small risk-free rate, correlated spreads, a little bit too correlated, and volatile spreads. So it can get all three. And we're working on some details of getting this number to match even better. Then we also use a bunch of stock market data, price dividend ratio, volatility of price dividend ratios, correlations, correlations, et cetera. So the bottom line is we have, and we have more in the paper, but we have a variety of data on real features and financial data, and we choose the parameters so that the model matches it pretty well. All right, now in terms of the analysis, let's look at each shock and what it does. Let's take the world volatility shock first. Here's one standard deviation world volatility shock. And, the peak, and as the world gets more risky, price dividend ratios go down, spreads go up, real risk free rate moves a bit. But basically look at these two. World gets more volatile, price dividend ratios go down, spreads go up. Relative to the next pictures, there's gonna be a relatively small response from world volatility to price dividend ratios and a relatively large response in the FREDs. Spreads. And a useful norm is the change in spreads over the change in price dividend ratios uh, as this, and it's 27. And that's going to mean in a minute that sigma has a huge effect on the spreads and a relatively mild effect on price dividends. So it's going to, in the data, it's going to mean later that the world volatility is going to mainly target spreads. Now, if you do a long run risk shock, this is the serially correlated component of growth rates in the north. When it gets bad, it's gonna show up as the growth rates in the North get bad. Not so much from two to 1.85, but it's super persistent. And that's gonna to lead to price dividend ratios to fall because the prospects are bad and the spread's gonna go up. But relatively speaking, remember this is 27, this is only three. So it has a relatively small change in the spread, a relatively big change in the own stock market. So XN is gonna end up targeting the own stock market. Southern shocks are, like, are similar. Now remember, this is an own country shock. So it's really XSI. This is um, Brazil's own shock, not a common com component. So that's what it's gonna do to Brazil. It's gonna make Brazil stock market fall a lot and Brazil spread go up a lot. And so its, it's ratio, it mainly affects Brazil's uh, price dividend ratio and not so much the spread. Now there's a second component we didn't do, which is these are also correlated. So it's also going to have a correlated component against the South. But in general, the South shocks are not going to do much. They're mainly going to target its own spreads and a little bit their own default rates. I'll come back to that. So in summary, the volatility shock is going to have a small impact on the stock market in the North and the South and a large impact on the spread. That's going to leave the volatility shock free mainly to target the spreads. The long run risk in the North is going to have a large impact on the North stock market and a relatively small impact on spreads. It's going to leave it free to mainly target that. And the long run risk in the South is tricky because it's going to have a large impact on the own stock market and its own spread from Brazilian zone shock, but a small impact on the common component because they're not that correlated across countries. Now, to drive the common component of world spreads is really only two candidates, the long run risk in the North and the world volatility. Why? Because the long run risk in the South accounts mainly for this Southern country's own spread, not the common component of spread we're trying to explain and only a modest amount to that common component. So I'm gonna focus mainly on these two and I'm gonna come back to that at the end. We're gonna use a particle filter as opposed to a common filter because this thing is highly nonlinear, which makes it a bit of a beast to compute. I'll just say, uh, I'll say that and I'll say kudos to my co-authors uh, co on this. And we're gonna do, we're gonna look at four. We're gonna pull out four countries, Mexico, Brazil, Philippines, and Turkey. We're gonna have observables for stock markets, price dividends, growth rates, and spreads. And we're going to have 11, 11 observables and 11 shocks. And then we're going to figure out from the model what shocks are driving what. So here's the data, Mexico, Brazil, Philippines, and Turkey. Look at the black line first on the left and on the right, this black line. What you see is, what you see is a big common component to the spreads 
and in the model and in the data. Is so the blacks are a big common component and you have spikes in these. And the, the whole reason we're getting these own spikes is because the own XI component, the own long, long run risk component. But so there's a large carbon component in the spreads and in the model. We're trying to explain this black line without doing complete violence to the individual experiences. So what's going to account for it? Long run risk or volatility? We're going to do some counterfactual experiments where we turn off the other shocks and you'll see it. But the punchline is going to be volatility is going to play the biggest role in the common component, especially in the great spread reduction. Long run risk in the north is going to attribute just a bit to lower spreads in the pre period and in the great re and short and higher spreads in the great recession. But it's basically going to be volatility target spreads, long run risk target stock markets. So here are the episodes. Here's the emerging markets crisis, where you see uh, high price dividend ratios and high spreads. The middle period, where you see stable price dividend ratios and falling spreads, which is very curious. And the Great Recession, everything went to the pot, both bad spreads and bad stock markets. Our model fits this pretty well. These extra lines are how our model fits. The original lines are the data. So let's look at this first period. High stock prices and high spreads justified by high X. So good, good growth prospects nail the stock market. The high spreads are going to be justified by high world volatility. So you can have good and bad mixed in to justify this trickier period. It's possible because as I showed you with those impulse responses, they have differential effects where XN drives mostly stocks and Sigma drives mostly spreads. So let's look at this, zoom in on this picture. So you have high PD ratios, which the model looks at and says, okay, that's a high long run growth prospect. And then let me do this, high PD ratios, high XN. Okay, now how do I hit this high spread that went from here to here? Well, high Sigma. So growth prospects went up, Sigma went up, I justify these two. How do you can tell that? You can see that if you turn off, this is the baseline PD ratio. If you turn off the long run growth prospects, you would have gotten this line. You would have gotten nothing. So it's telling you that this is all driven by the XN. Now, if you look at the spreads, if you would have turned off the volatility, you would have gone from this blue, you would have gone to here. So without volatility, you would have gotten nothing. And then uh, secondary role played by XN. So. XN justifies the stocks, pushes down spreads, high sigma justifies the spreads, little effect on stocks. Now, this is the most interesting period to us. You have falling spreads and stable stock prices. So it's really hard to say the North was driving any of this because it, it wasn't particularly great in terms of stock prices and spreads went really low. This is the interesting and sort of the most puzzling bit. So the model looks at the data and they see, eh, not much happened in the North in terms of its stock. And you do, eh, a little bit, not so great prospects, not much. But look at this, you have this huge drop in the spreads. Look at the levels, it's squished in, but you're going from eight to two. You have this huge drop in the spreads. The model looks at it and says, ah, I'm blaming that on world volatility. Okay, now if you do it, if you see it, what's happening to the stock market, again, without XN, you would have got nothing in the stock market, even as the, oops, sorry, I'm in the wrong period. You would have gotten, you would have gotten nothing in the, sorry, I'm in this period, sorry. You would have gotten nothing. But this is the interesting bit to me. If you want to justify this huge drop in spreads, it's all coming from Sigma, absent Sigma, it's more or less would have been flat, but it's this huge drop in sigma the model does to back this up. The great spread moderation is accounted for by falling volatility. So now the great recession is more trivial in a way. You'd think it would be the biggest, but it's doubly bad. You have stock prices go down, spike in the spreads. How do you do it? Well, things go bad. It's easy this time because they're both going the same way. The North growth prospects are down and sigma's going up, so you have an increase in risk. So it's double bad. It's the period before this harder. So you see double bad. PD ratios down, spreads up. The model looks at it and says, well, it's double bad. So I want to justify this, I just make XN go down. And to justify this, I just make sigma go up. 
Yeah, you got five. Yeah, I'm almost done actually. So you get, so I can even slow down. Um, I can even take a question. If I'm, uh, since I'm flying, I could even take a question. If you have any, speak up. Um, Cause you have, now where was I? So the price dividend ratios fall and spreads go up. The model looks at it and says, how can I get those price dividend ratios to fall? I can use the good growth prospects to do it. And how do I get this spread to go up? Mainly the spike in, 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 in volatility a bit. And if you turn off again, if you turn off the growth prospects, you get no action in the spread in the, in the um, growth prospects. And if you turn off the volatility, this is a bit more subtle, but if you turn off the volatility, if you turn off X, XN is doing a teeny bit to these spreads and volatility is doing most of the rest. So I went flying through that a little bit, but I think it's sort of intuitive. Um, what about the XS? This is a bit tricky because there's two parts of XS. This XSI, which is what actually happens in the country. And there's a common component of X. I'll call it an XS. Now remember, we have the correlation between XSs is about 0.4. So there's a sizable common component in the, in the growth rate prospects of the South. And there's a there's also, but most of it is idiosyncratic. So that's what's trickier about it because what the XS can do is the own part of the XS can is the reason why you can have Brazil having huge spikes when Turkey doesn't, because that's the own component affecting their own spread. And the northerners looking at Turkey and saying, oh, you're in a bad excess situation, so I'm gonna charge you high spreads. But it doesn't do that much for the common component because the excesses couldn't be that correlated or else you'd violate, you'd make the alpha growth rates too correlated. And that's the thing we don't wanna do. So that's why it's a bit subtle. So the excess has enough room to do your own stuff and it can get the uncorrelated bit of your own stock market and the uncorrelated bit of your own spreads. That's why, and I, since I got a minute, I'll go back. That's why the model can get this. This is the uncorrelated bit of XS, XI can get this bit. And it still contributes some to the correlated bit, but you can't make it be too common, too, too big of a common bit or, a one, or, or would violate the basic thing, which is make an alpha growth to correlate. That's why excess is a bit subtle and we stuck at last. Okay, so, and then so, both excess and sigma move the price dividend ratio, but the spread still mainly from volatility. So, the spreads to play a, a volatile common component, even though growth rate is not highly correlated. That's the main puzzle for all the 50 papers or 100 papers that followed uh, um, Christine and all, and Eaton Gersovitz early on. Stochastic volatility is key for the dynamics of the common components. Now this is this paper is still in progress and we've been working on it hard this week, but the tentative bottom line, and we got to do some more work before we can say this fully, there is a view that Northern lenders drive everything. In fact, if you look at the Longstaff Singleton and some of the other works, I think Elaine has this in some of her work that Northern lenders and Calvo and Mendoza had it, Northern lenders are driving all the common component. Some bad stuff happens, Northern lenders balance sheets go bad. And through that badness in the Northern balance sheet, it transmits to all the South. And the South guys are sitting there and it's all the Northerners fault because the South comes, the North is doing it all to them. This is given a more subtle interpretation of the data. There's a bit of that, but most of it is through this world volatility shock that's both coming from the quantity of risk in the South and the quantity risk in the North, and it's not all the Northerners. And because of that, we think, and this is what we got to work on, is showing that we have this alternative view to this, that the Northern drive mostly the common component is not, is, is, is not, gonna, is not working so well. And likewise, the view that the own pure growth rate shocks in the South drive all the spreads, I'll say that's the Ariano simple view, is not gonna work either. So it's this more mixed, thing with common component of volatility, which people don't normally talk about, and the own growth prospects to mostly hit your stock market. So this more nuanced view that has bits of both. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Pat. Um, 
I see that some questions are being handled. Jan Bai, for example, responded to a question in the chat, uh, and that's good. We will have a few minutes at the end of the session. As I mentioned, but some of you may not have heard, uh, Pat will send out a, an invitation to have a Zoom meeting at, uh, with, uh, at Stanford after this session, because there's just so much to talk about here and not enough time. And let me, let me do this right now and tell me that everyone <laughs> gets it. No, it's just going to be the invitation. So I send an invitation in chat. So at the very end of it, click on this, and hopefully we can all chit chat at the end. Do you see it? Uh, I send it to all panelists and invitees. Tease. Thank you. Yeah, I see it. I see it. Okay. Thanks so just a lot, click Pat. on that right at the end, and we should all move to a separate chat room and can chit chat. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Ricardo, Ricardo Reich is going to present the next paper. Thanks, Ricardo. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen in here? Can you just say yes? Yeah. Can you see it? I hope so. Yes. Okay. Tell me now. Okay. I, I, I can see it. It's very perfect. Perfect. Yes. Uh, great. So this is um, joint work with Salim Bahaj, my brilliant co-author who just had a baby. So you'll have to put up with me instead of him presenting this. Um, and this is a paper of us trying to make sense of international currencies. International currency, let me define it as a currency that's used in a significant extent outside of the issuing country's borders. And depending on exactly what you mean by significant, there's as little as five and maybe as much as eight or nine uh, international currencies in the world. So very, very few. Indeed, if you look back 11 years, in 2009, even though China was already the largest exporter of goods in the world and the largest creditor in the world, the RMB was not an international currency. It was essentially its usage outside of China was essentially zero. And so we were trying to, well, what happened in China in 2009, though, was that faced with that, um, the Chinese government said, well, we would like the RMB to become an international currency. And they pursued a three-pronged approach to the so-called internationalization of the RMB. One, a stable exchange rate, which, of course, they had been doing already before. Second, a trade settlement scheme, whereby you could, you could actually settle RMB debt outside of the Chinese borders, unlike what had been true before. And third, and importantly, the setting up of a series of swap lines between the People's Bank of China's um, central bank and central banks all over the world. And what those swap lines do essentially is that they say that if I'm a firm or better, a bank in say South Africa, I know that I can go to my central bank and via the swap line have access to a discount window, a lender of last resort in RMB that's supplied by the People's Bank of China. So now these policies or and or luck or circumstances or others were very successful. The RMB 10 years later now is an international currency. Um, its usage depending on the measure is something like three or 5% of all payments or credit, or again, it depends a little bit on what's your, your, your measure for it, um, but they seem to have worked. And moreover, these policies um, are not that unique. If you look back a hundred years from now, at the US in 1912, the US was also the large exporter in the world. And yet also the dollar was not an international currency at all. And the Federal Reserve Act, which we associate with monetary policy and all that implies for inflation, was also a set of policies that one, led to a stable dollar, and two, very importantly, uh, deregulated banks, similar to the trade settlement pilot scheme, allowing US banks to open match support, and three, the actions of especially Benjamin Strong, the president of the New York Fed, were very geared towards starting a market in the US for trade credit in New York, which was very much backed by having a very aggressive lender of last resort uh, for dollar trade credit to the extent that the US, the New York Fed would often buy very large amounts. So it was a lender of last resort that was often a present or even first resort in some regard. So similar policies, and we saw that the dollar indeed uh, succeeded in becoming international currency. So what we want to ask here is, um, we want to do two things in this paper. First, we want to provide a model to try and make sense of why is it that a currency can go from not being international to being international. Thus our jump start in the title. We're going to focus on a, where's, there's a literature, there's a very rich literature on why, for instance, the dollar is the dominant currency. We want to instead make sense of why a currency is rising. Why does it arise in the first place when in a world in which a dominant one prevails? And secondly, we want to write a model in which there's an interaction between invoicing and the currency of credit 
because we have these central bank policies that seem to, in the case of the Fed 100 years ago, in the case of the PBOC in the last decade, seem to have been able to at least be associated with triggering this jumpstart. And those are policies that work on the, uh, the cost, the price of credit, seem to have interacted with the invoicing, and in doing so lead to the jumpstart. So that's the first thing we want to do is have a mall to try to make sense of this. The second thing is that we're going to go and analyze empirically these PBOC swap lines. In particular, we're going to compare countries that signed the swap line, those that did not, and we're going to essentially exploit the time variation of when you sign these swap lines, we're going to control versus result, you're going to use different sources of variation to try and understand how did this one particular policy affect the use of the RMB, and we're going to find that it was quite effective in that the probability that a country, again, South Africa, uses the RMB um, is increased by somewhere between 13 and 25% because once the PBOC signs a swap line with a South African central bank. So that's what I'm going to do. So model. The model is really a working capital model. So it really follows in the tradition of Larry's work on working capital from, I don't know, 25 years ago or something. In which there's a morning and a night and you have to borrow in order to conduct production and get your revenues for get your revenues at night. Instead of two peers, you're going to have three just because period one and two could be, could be collapsed into one. But I think that allows a little bit of clarity in the presentation. There's two key choices in period zero before the uncertainty of the day is realized. That's between the morning and the night. Is that one, you're gonna choose a technology in the sense of whether your inputs are gonna come from the rising currency or the dominant currency country or currency invoice. Okay, so you're gonna choose what's gonna be the technology used in the sense of the, the weights and the bundle of goods that you use between, low, between uh, rising and dominant currency. And the second is the more, so this is more novel if you want a little bit relative to the um, existing literature. And second, very much like in existing literature, there's gonna be a sticky price and then you're gonna to have to choose whether to set a price in either the dominant currency, the rising currency, your local currency or where you're selling, the, uh, sorry, the, the local currency where you're selling or the producer currency, meaning where you are. Uh, and once you've set that price, depending then on what happens to the exchange, the quantities, then you'll supply whatever quantity that is, and that will lead to volatility in revenues, okay? Then the key risks are twofold. One is the exchange rate, again, the classic in this literature, but two, uh, there's a firm specific interest rate that says that now having fixed technology, I now need to borrow to buy my rising currency input, borrow because only later then will I collect the revenue, will I be able to repay that, okay? And then you're always going to repay that. And again, this period is mechanical. In terms of the um, equilibrium, if you want, of the markets, think about it as being in each individual country I, or in each individual country, there's firms in a unit interval, and they sell to markets, which are in a unit interval indexed by I. The bigger J means the more volatile is my firm specific interest rate risk. So these firms, they know they can borrow in RMB at a very constant, I don't know, 5% interest rate. These ones say, well, sometimes I get charged 20%, sometimes I get charged 2%, probably because I'm a very risky borrower. And secondly, I'm selling from, uh, again, imagine that I'm in South Africa, I'm selling both to Mozambique as well as to um, Russia or the US and my exchange rate between the South African Rand and where I'm selling can be either very volatile, or very stable or more volatile when it comes to that, okay? Then there's of course the dominant market, the US and the rising market, China, which they have positive mass taking into account the fact that these are large countries, okay? Key ingredients then, the third action technology. We're gonna do this by, through a very simple Leontio. If you choose this ADA, what's the weight that then in period one, when you're going to produce your technology, is going to be the weight that you use the inputs from the R rising currency versus dominant one. And you know that if you borrow in the dominant currency, then you pay Q, per, you receive uh, uh, um, Q dollars, and you're going to have to pay one dollar back. Um, but if you borrow in the R currency, the R currency is simply more volatile. You never quite know the, what the interest rate is going to be, meaning uh, well, when you borrow, you know the interest rate, but exactly at period zero, that interest rate could be higher or lower because it's coming from some distribution. Again, this one is deterministic just for simplicity. What matters is that when you're borrowing an RMB, when you're establishing a technology for borrowing an RMB, you know that you're going to be subject to a lot more volatility than if you borrow in dollars. Okay. The other ingredient on the, on the sticky price currency is that if I set my price in market A, me from J, P, I, J, if I set it in my currency, produce a currency in the South African Rand, then I know that's what's going to be my revenue for each unit I sell. 
But if I set it instead in Mozambican currency, then I have to multiply by the bilateral exchange between the RAND and Mozambique. If I do it in dollars, the dollar exchange rate. If I do it in RMB, oh, typo here, it should be SR with that exchange rate. And these exchange rates are all going to be uh, coming from some distribution, which I'm going to assume is log normal, as well as there's going to be, I'm going to use also some local inputs, and those also have some uh, covariance with the dollar and the, do or the dominant and the rising currency. The problem here, though, with the firm is the following. You know, firms are maximizing expected profit, they're risk neutral, but they realize that ex post, after the uncertainty is realized on the interest rate and on the exchange rates, there's going to be deviation from their market of marginal costs, and they would like that market as an optimal value for that market. There's not to be constant because of the excessive preferences. So they are trying to choose the currency of their marginal costs being their choice of inputs and the currency of their revenues in order to minimize those discrepancies because either any discrepancy from the constant markup leads to a fall in profits. Results. Let's, let me focus just on a current, let's start with the case of a currency that's chosen to borrow for trade credit RMB, okay? And I'm gonna call this a lemma because there's a version of these results in the literature already. Um, innovation here, if only, is more pedagogical in that with our log normal assumptions, everything is kind of neat and flows form and analytical. First, if I'm already borrowing in RMB, I want to price in RMB as opposed to dollars. Why? Because I want to match the currency of my um, costs with the currency of my revenues. Okay. Second, I want to do RMB instead of local currency. I'm going to big insight in this pricing literature insofar as the variance of the local exchange rate of that market is sufficiently high, meaning, look, if it's very volatile, my exchange rate, when I'm in South Africa selling to Germany, if it's very volatile, the exchange rate of the RAND to the Euro, then I'm better off just pricing it in RMB. Um, because there's, a, and there's, and in this model shows up as a very elegant threshold phi. Third, if the covariance of the RMB with my local inputs, say the price of wages, W um, in, in South Africa, is higher, again, I'm okay with doing RCP instead of pricing in rands because there's going to be a map between that component of marginal input, of marginal cost, I'm sorry, of cost, with my revenues. And so there's a second threshold here, which I'm going to call omega. So if the RMB is relatively stable relative to other currencies, the Botswana currency, and the covariance in the RMB and South African cost is high, you're above these thresholds, then given credit, you want a price um, in RMB as well. But now, and here is the proposition, the, the novel part in our with our modeling of working capital. First, you want to go bang, bang. You either want to borrow entirely in RMB or in dollars. And why? Because firms are risk neutral. So you really, there's no diversification here if you want. You're going to choose our credit instead of dollar credit if the volatility expressed in this expression, this expectation of, if you want, of the interest rate uh, weighted by these alphas, um, is going to be small enough. Okay, so if borrowing an RMB is low enough in an average and second moment sense relative to the dollar, then you want to borrow in, in RMB. And this threshold, my third threshold, is going to be larger, and so it's more likely to borrow an RMB if, first of all the share of market, which I'm already pricing in RMB is higher. If I'm already doing a lot of price in RMB, I want to borrow an RMB. Second, if the RMB market to start with is already large and I'm already selling a lot to it. And thirdly, again, if you have that same covariance, which note leads there for this complementary between the two choices. In particular, say we're starting from this economy where everyone, every firm in South Africa is borrowing in, uh, in, um, in dollars and is pricing either in dollars or in whatever local currency there is, they're only pricing in RMB when they sell to China. Then um, consider a policy like creating a swap line. What does a swap line do? Swap line, all it does is say, look, don't worry about having a very high interest rate. If you ever got a really high interest, rate, a very bad draw, don't worry, you can just come to the swap line and I'll lend to you at the swap line rate, okay? You can just go to the PBOC and say, look, I just want to discount my credit um, and therefore I don't need to pay these 30% people are asking me. I can just do it at the fixed interest rate of the, uh, of the RMB swap. Okay. What that does, as well as, by the way, if you think of a deregulation, think of a deregulation is basically meaning that after you deregulate, the, there's a first source stochastic dominance of the old interest rate distribution relative to the new one. All you've done is lower um, financial costs in this very particular sense. 
Well, then what does that do? Well, because now it's cheaper in the sense of this proposition, in this expression here, to borrow in RMB, you're going to start borrowing in RMB. But as you start borrowing in RMB, then you want to start pricing in some markets in RMB. But as you price in some markets in RMB, you want to borrow more in RMB to line up your costs with the output in those markets. And so you see how as you cross the three thresholds, you go from zero RMB usage to now some firms using RMB in South Africa and using it to price into some markets, a share of the markets. And this is essentially the lender of last resort insight that even if no one is going or only very, very rarely do you ever go and borrow from uh, the PBOC, those RMB, just the fact that it's cut the right tail means that you're very will, you're much more willing now to start using the RMB. Okay. What if you have a stable exchange rate? Well, the stable exchange rate means if I have a more stable exchange, a more stable RMB means, hey, I want to price more in RMB, but if I price more in RMB, I want to borrow more in RMB. And again, you have the complementarity in the area of this rectangle rising. What if the RMB market, what if China rises? Well, if China rises, then I'm, I'm selling more to China. That means a lot more of my revenue is coming in RMB because I want to use RMB currency pricing there. And because of that, I now want to borrow more in RMB. And so that moves to the right. And finally, recall this last condition, what happens if the covariance of the RMB with South Africa and say producer price index or cost of inputs goes up? Well, if that happens, then, um, some firms that would have been doing producer currency pricing, producer currency pricing, say pricing in rands when they export to South Africa, now we're going to be doing RMB currency pricing, and again the same complementarity is going to grow. So four predictions from the model. There's going to be very few international currencies, just like we see in the world. Why? Because these are three very demanding thresholds. Most currencies are too volatile. Their countries are too small in terms of the baskets, and borrowing in uh, in their currency is just too expensive. You're just very far from the thresholds no matter what your central bank or policy does. But secondly, if you sign a swap line with PBOC, PBOC, when China is large in the basket, has had a stable exchange rate, then by making credit cheaper, and again, in that precise sense, then you are going to, to start using the RMB, not just to China, but starting, if you're in South Africa, using the RMB to price to Mozambique and Mozambique back to South Africa, if you want. Third, and more subtle, when a country, if Mozambique signs a um, swap line with China, then because the Mozambicans are going to start now using more RMB, me in South Africa who's selling to Mozambique, I now want to use more RMB. So even if I'm not the one who signed the swap line, if my trading partner signed the swap line, I will want to use more of it. And finally, fourth, if I sort countries by this covariance between, say, wage costs or, or local costs and the RMB, those sorts of covariances higher are going to have a larger impact of the policy on the RMB usage than those sorts of covariances more. So with those predictions, we went and collected a bunch of new data on these swap lines. Just since 2009, this is the number of agreements in gray and in black, the cumulative value of the amounts committed. And you see this very large rise in um, swap lines that the central bank PBOC has signed with every other central bank. Here's the full network where darker is how big it is. The one with the ECB is gigantic, even bigger than the one with Hong Kong, but also very large with Australia and Great Britain and Canada. The one with Uzbekistan is tiny, but still you see here that there's many, many, many countries that have now signed these swap lines. So their firms, their banks can um, engage in credit in RMB knowing they have a lender of last resort in RMB. Okay. Now, at the same time, the RMB share has risen from zero, like I told you, to now being somewhere around 4% of all payments in the payments data that I'm going to be using. Um, the question then is, does the red lead to the blue? Was it the signing of the swap lines that contributed to this blue line or not? Right away from the data, so I'm going to be using the SWIFT data, which is essentially the data at the country level. Um, and so I don't have firm level data, but I have country level data. But importantly, I have the entire network. That is, I have the all of the world, all of the payments. And this is whenever you make a bank transfer, it goes to SWIFT. I see, I see those payments and I know what share of them is, um, was in RMB or not. And what you, the first thing you see when you plot the data is that many countries didn't have um, any RMB payments and then they start having them. And so really it's about the jump start again. It goes back to the, the title of the paper, to the model. It's really about why is it that you go from zero to a positive amount. And so we're gonna be using a lot of probability models of how you start going from zero to positive. 
as opposed to linear models where you'd be getting why Mongolia uses a little more or a little less. Um, it's clear from there that you want to do a linear probability model of some kind. So effects. Here is the one picture to remember, if that's the one picture you remember is empirical work. Here is the RMB share in cross-border payments of a country, median across countries. Zeros when you sign the swap line, months before, months after. And it just smacks you in the eye. I mean, you sign the swap line, boom, you start using the RMB. And this gradually builds for about 12 to 18 months and then more or less stabilizes subject to the noise that comes from this big immediate. So that's that, you know, you see, you sign the swap line, you start using the RMB. Now, from this picture alone, you may say, well, but I really worry, or there's really one big concern, which is reverse causality or omitted variable, meaning maybe it's because we we're going to use a lot of the RMB that we in South Africa called our Chinese friends and say, hey, can we sign a swap line because we're going to be using the RMB? If you want the causality, it doesn't go from the swap line to the use of the RMB, it goes from where we're going to use the RMB, we expected to use it, we're forward looking, we signed uh, a swap line with the country. Or alternatively, there was some factor that both drove us to be closer to China and sign a swap line among other things with them, and as well to start doing more trade with China and therefore have more payments. So how are we going to deal with that, with that observed factor? First, time fixed effects. If whatever factor was common to countries, China just became a more prominent country, a larger country than 10 years, the time fixed effects should, should uh, take care of those factors. Second, country fixed effects. If it turns out that there was something about South Africa that make it more likely to both use the RMB and sign a swap line BBOC, South Africa just happens to be very close to China for some reason, then the country fixed effects will take care of that. Third, we're going to say, well, imagine that it's not about South Africa, but it's about Southern Africa. Something happened in Southern Africa. There was some trend, some change in the 2010s that due to some trade, political productivity, uh, that's what drove it. Well, we're going to control for the share used by your neighbors. So it's just the, the, PB, the signing the swap line with that. Fourth, maybe it has to do with, again, trade. It's just that we knew that we're going to trade more. Maybe you knew that you're just, you're producing something the Chinese really like or the other way around. Well, we're going to control for a bunch of um, relationship with China factors, namely, and more crucially, whether you trade a lot with China or not. And finally, fourthly, Maybe what happened is that there was really something about Chinese policy with this country, something about some non-trade capital flows. And so we had a control for whether, and particularly important is whether you were part of this, um, uh, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, the Great Road, oh, I forget. Great, uh, the Belt, uh, the Belt Road uh, thing, which is you sign, you start getting a lot of um, loans from the Asian Investment Bank. You see a lot of infrastructure investment financed by China or others. So we had a control for all of those. And so when you do the probability models, you're trying to understand to what extent we start using the RMB and you do all Ricardo, that. Ricardo, yeah. uh, uh, four minutes, four minutes. Four minutes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, then you see that the effect is either a 27% increase in probability you can use the RMB or with all the controls, roughly 12 to 15 to 14%, depending on how you do it, okay? So this seems to be very robust, meaning it's a, it's, you sign a swap line, the swap line itself, just as predicted in the model, Taking the swap line as the exogenous shock and the RMB the endogenous seems to at least be supported by this flurry of uh, evidence. But here's two, this is the extensive margin. What if you look, uh, if you do it instead because of the zero, well, forget this. This is how much you would increase it. You increase by essentially going from zero to 2%. But let me talk about then two other alternative strategies. What if we use say, well, the controls are one way to get at it. Another way is to use an IV approach, which is, it turns out that when you sign these swap lines, when it turns out that Xi Jinping is doing a state visit and you sign this contract uh, because that's when he's there and you actually happen to sign it. So we're going to use as an instrument whether you got a state visit from China. It's super correlated with whether you sign a swap line. Again, the swap lines are often signed. You know, it's all those things. The premier goes there and you sign lots of things while they're around. Well, let's see to what extent instrumenting with that has an effect. And indeed, it has a very. It shows that there's a very large effect with that. Okay, so you, the results, if you want, uh, use it. Because note here, now the timing is, I'm using the fact that South Africa signed its swap line in June, whereas, I don't know, Algeria signed it in December. Why? Because Xi Jinping happened in the agenda, happened to be able to visit one in June and then December. So I'm using just that variation and still I find those effects. Okay. Another strategy, which comes straight from the model is, well, what if Mozambique signs the swap line? So that potentially could be, it should be exogenous South Africa. 
So let's see when Mozambique signs a swap line. Use the Mozambique swap line date. And again, we see these relatively large effects. And as the model predicts, smaller than, uh, than if you sign it, but still very significant. And finally, there was that sorting on covariances that works very well as well in the data, in that if there's a high correlation between your local PPI, producer price index, and the RMB, you're more likely to see an effect. There's this clear difference between the two. So to conclude in my last, oh, my clock just stopped, but I think I have a minute. Um, parting thoughts, being an internet, we wanted, there's a very rich literature on dominant currencies. We kind of were just thinking, well, I just want to understand why a currency just starts being international in the first place. And why does a currency start being international in the first place? We said, look, it depends on financial markets, working capital credit, not just on the trade fundamentals, and policy affects those. So we're in a model where there's clear complement, there's a lot of complementarity between credit and invoicing, and this comes with these thresholds that most countries don't meet. Some do, and policy can cause you to jump these thresholds, therefore mat matching this thing in the data where you go from zero to then being a positive. Empirically, the RMB swap line by removing the right tail risk of RMB financing increased by either 13% or maybe as much as 25%, depending on which justification, increase the probability that you will make and receive RMB payments. And finally, look, the RMB is still very far from the dollar, uh, from where the dollar is, or even where the dollar was by 1925, 1930. You, some of it may be luck, some of it from the fact that the, the interest rate of the RMB is still very far from the Federal Reserve Act when it comes to removing capital controls, the capital control removal that you saw in the US with the Federal Reserve Act is still way ahead of what the Chinese did. And so this says that you need further policies in light of the model and the data if you want the RB to be even more used. But at least you got to jumpstart. Thank you. Thanks, Ricardo. That was really cool. Uh, Sylvia is here, but, but I think uh, Helen Ray is going to present the, uh, their joint uh, paper. Yeah. Can you see the slides? Yes, yes. Very good. So we have 15 minutes, right? Until the end of the session? No, 30. Yeah, it's a 30. Okay, good. Um, okay, so this is um, joint work with Sylvia and, uh, and Sveti, uh, who are both here. And we are going to um, revisit the global footprints of monetary policy. It's an empirical paper so far. And uh, it's still relatively preliminary, so uh, we are very happy to have uh, comments. We are looking in this paper at a very uh, classic topic, which is the uh, avenues of uh, international monetary policy transmission. And uh, we all know about uh, standard models, uh, such as the classic Mendelian uh, framework, which um, have implication for transmission of monetary policy through uh, uh, the trade sides of the models, through uh, foreign exchange uh, markets, and uh, and where the property depends crucially on the stickiness of prices together with the currency of, uh, of invoice. Uh, so uh, Ricardo just talked about dominant currencies versus other types of invoice. So this is all very relevant. Um, but we also know that there are other types of transmission mechanism which operate more through financial markets, through the integration of, uh, of financial markets, and this goes through risk premia, leverage of financial intermediaries, capital flows, asset prices in general, and um, one can uh, see there in the empirical estimates that uh, foreign exchange markets uh, act as, bet as best as a, as a partial shocks absorber, and this is the uh, uh, debate between uh, dilemma and, uh, and trilemma. But there are also other uh, transmission mechanisms that uh, are uh, not uh, uh, very well explored and they have to do with uh, global value chains. Uh, so there could be some additional transmission effect from integrated production chain um, for various types of constraints. And of course, all these channels may operate together. So we are going to try to uh, throw some lights uh, on uh, some empirical facts on those uh, transmission mechanisms, looking both at US monetary policy on one hand, uh, which, as you will guess, will be very much uh, linked to the financial side of things, and also something at the opposite end of the spectrum, maybe, which is the Chinese monetary policy. So to um, get an idea of what um, the world looks like, uh, we plot here a network of uh, uh, countries in the world linked via uh, financial positions. So these are, uh, you have big nodes here, the size of the nodes are um, proportional to uh, 
assets and liabilities of the various countries and uh, the countries are linked by their assets with one another. And you can see that um, the US of course is very dominant in such a network uh, and you have another a relatively important network, which is around uh, Europe. If we consolidated the Euro area, we would have a pretty sizable node as well here. And in that type of network, China is very small. It's uh, this little thing here. Um, there's Hong Kong. Uh, so you see that uh, essentially, if we think of the world as a network via financial flows, where there's a very, a very dominant player here, and, and, and that's the United States, plus a second player, uh, which, is, uh, which is Europe. Now, this is not um, surprising, uh, given uh, a very nice paper that Zheng uh, Yang presented, and uh, also what uh, Ricardo uh, just discussed. I'm not going to spend any time on this. Uh, there are lots of reasons and lots of ways in which uh, the US dollar is dominant in the world economy, and in particular, uh, in financial markets. So we have a function as anchor currency, uh, functions of international financial transactions, um, world banker function, reserve currency, et cetera. So all this explains why the US, uh, or rather is a description as how the US is very dominant in the financial network. Uh, and also what is, uh, uh, what we found in, uh, with Sylvia in, in a previous paper, is that uh, there is a lot of uh, co-movement in international financial prices. Um, in fact, we, I will show you uh, the estimate of a global factor in, uh, in risky asset prices, and I will show you how US monetary policy uh, is actually important uh, in, um, in, uh, in determining the fluctuation of that uh, global factor in risky asset prices. Uh, now there's a lot more empirical evidence on the so-called international risk-taking channel of, of monetary policy, in particular of US monetary policy, with a lot of uh, really interesting uh, paper here. There's more than, than what I could put in here. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, of nice work on that. But the other way of looking at uh, network in the world economy, of course, is not only through financial linkages, but it's through trade linkages. And here, so uh, what we have is uh, the trade as measured in, in value added. And again, the size of a node is gonna be proportional to the value added here. Um, you see that the picture looks quite different uh, this time. We still have the US, which is really big, uh, but China now becomes seriously big as well when we look at the international trade. And Europe is still uh, quite big with uh, Germany seem to be quite a player as well in that network. So uh, the world looks a little bit more multipolar uh, if, we, uh, if we think about trade uh, networks. So this was based on value added and uh, size based on some of the exports and imports. Here we, we look at exports, uh, only exports. Uh, and so uh, there are more countries and you see that the same type of picture emerges with China here. Uh, and the US becoming, uh, well, being a very important node and, and still Germany in there uh, being also an important player. So very asymmetric uh, shapes of, um, of trade networks and of uh, financial networks uh, according to, um, to the data. So now that we uh, have established these, uh, these stylized facts, um, uh, we are going to, um, to uh, do an empirical characterization of international transmission of monetary policy of the US uh, and of China. That's what we call the two uh, world giants here. Of course, we are still missing also Europe in there, but we are focusing on the extreme in this, uh, in this, uh, in this paper. Ideally, uh, the goal of this paper will be to account uh, for the time varying nature of the network structure, both on the financial side and on the uh, trade side, but that's not gonna be for today uh, yet, I'm afraid. So the first thing I'm gonna show you uh, is uh, the global financial estimates of this global financial factor uh, in, uh, on the financial market side. So I'm gonna show you the financial factor in, uh, in asset prices and also uh, in international capital flows, uh, which is new compared to our earlier work. And uh, I will revisit uh, the transmission of uh, US monetary policy to this uh, global financial uh, uh, factor. 
And then I will uh, look at uh, Chinese monetary policy with a new indicator of uh, PBOC monetary policy. So here we go. Uh, what happens on the financial side? So the way we are estimating our global factor is like in our earlier work, uh, we are going to not only to use risky asset prices as before, but also I will present you some uh, results on capital flows. And there we are fitting a dynamic factor model. So uh, everybody is loading on the global factor. There could be more than one. And then we also have regional factors. And then we have idiosyncratic components, which could be uh, correlated uh, with one another. What kind of risky asset prices are we talking about? We're talking about equities, commodity prices, some uh, corporate bond prices. So it's a very broad cross section of, uh, of risky assets. And it's uh, not only uh, uh, advanced economies, but it's also emerging economies. So the data is gonna be monthly between 1980 and 2019. Uh, and uh, we are gonna have a broad cross, cross section, roughly uh, uh, 1000 time series. What about the capital flows? So the capital flows, we are gonna use uh, the IMF uh, data on inflows and outflows, which has data on FDI, portfolio flows, both equity and debt, and also um, other, the other category, which uh, encompasses bank credit and also uh, trade credit. The data are quarterly. For our purposes, we will uh, uh, extrapolate to monthly data uh, we also have some alternative series, which are monthly from uh, a private firm uh, on, uh, on a broad sample as well. And uh, we can show that uh, essentially our estimates are similar. We have a big cross section, 82 countries. Now, so what we can do uh, when we estimate the global factors is first of all, to, to test how much of a variance and how many global factors the data tells us uh, there is essentially by running an Onatsky uh, test. So for the financial uh, side of things, the global factor in asset prices, what we find is that there is really one global factor and that's the uh, Leonaski test here. Um, and uh, that this global factor explain roughly, depending whether you look at the covariance matrix or the spectral density, it's between uh, 21 and 24% uh, of, uh, of the variance. Now for uh, capital flows, it's a little bit different. Uh, here we have not one global factor, but two, in fact. Uh, and uh, the variance explains a little bit different if you look at, the, uh, at these numbers or these numbers, uh, if you add them up, so uh, you, you get uh, either something around 13% here or something around 35% here. What do these uh, factors look like? Well, so uh, here, uh, this is the global factor in asset prices. This is our previous estimate, this is our updated data. Uh, so you see that they track uh, each other a lot. We have a, a broader cross section now and, 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 and updated data. Uh, you see the, the run up to the crisis, you see uh, the very sharp deep in the recession. Uh, so this is what, uh, what you would expect. How about the factor in capital flows? Well, the first factor in global capital flow, here it is, it is the, uh, the continuous line here. And in a way, the surprise, or what was not tri trivially expected, is that this global factor in capital flow is tracking very closely uh, the factor in asset prices. So you see there's a very close correlation between these two factors. So these price and, and quantities are remarkably correlated. Indeed, if you look at the correlation uh, between uh, this uh, uh, factor in asset prices and the first uh, factor in capital flow, global factor in capital flow, it's 0.81. So very large. The correlation with the second factor in capital flow uh, is, uh, is, is much smaller. And what's also interesting is that, uh, as we uh, also uh, showed earlier, the correlation between the factor in asset prices and, with, and the VIX is, is negative and, 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 uh, and high. And the same thing happens, of course, for the, uh, given their correlation here for their the factor in capital flows, which is also consistent with some uh, work of, by other people. For the uh, US dollar effective exchange rate, so it's negatively correlated with the uh, factor in asset prices and less so actually with the fact first factor in capital flows. Uh, but other uh, indices 
of uh, let's call that uh, uh, global risk aversion or, or, or financial pressure. Uh, so this is here, this is a, an index of uh, world financial condition. Uh, just like with the VIX, uh, is negatively correlated with the uh, first, uh, with the factor in asset prices and the first uh, factor in, uh, in capital flows. So this is again something that uh, many people have found. Uh, and what is more interesting maybe is that the second factor in capital flow uh, looks different uh, as we uh, noted before. And that factor is correlated with, so here these are the um, US treasury rates two year and 10 year. But very interestingly, also what it's quite highly correlated with are commodity prices um, this is world private liquidity measures, this is oil price, this is world industrial production, and this is world trade. So that second factor in capital flow seems to be highly correlated with the trade dimension of the data, the commodity dimension of the data, and that's quite different from the first uh, global factor in, in capital flows. So this is a finding that also, uh, uh, there's a, a recent paper by uh, uh, Davis, Valente, and Van Winkoop who find something similar on yearly data. All right, so uh, what uh, did we find so far? That uh, the global factor in asset prices uh, co-move with uh, risk aversion indices I mean, negatively. In the other works, we looked at also the co-movement with leverage. That for the quantity side, there are two global factors, and uh, it, uh, the first one comes strongly with the uh, asset price factor, and the second one is, uh, is more linked to global trade, production, and, uh, and commodity prices. So from that, there are probably some underlying common global uh, drivers, and we are going to explore the role of uh, uh, US monetary policy first. So for that, we are going to uh, to do a similar exercise to the one we did uh, earlier with Sylvia. So we are using um, a, a VAR, it's global because we're gonna use global variables. Uh, it's monthly data uh, and um, it's uh, estimated of a sample 91, 2018. And we are gonna use uh, for identification, the high frequency uh, instrument identification strategy of Gettler and Karadi. Uh, and that has been developed in, in other papers, in particular by Sylvia uh, later on as well. The variables we are going to look at are uh, the local industrial production, CPI, uh, the one year rate, and the foreign exchange. We're also going to introduce the global factors, of course, that's what we're interested in production, uh, trade, uh, and the financial condition index, liquidity. Uh, these are also uh, global variables commodity prices and VIX, and of course, also the capital flows. So here is what we, uh, what we find here. So we are looking at a tightening of US monetary policy of 100 basis points um, that, that shows up in 100 basis points in the, in the one year treasury rates, it's instrumented. Uh, and we are looking at the effects on uh, the real side. And you see here that there's not much happening on, uh, on world production, not much on world trade, a tiny bit. There are very uh, strong effects on world financial conditions, world private liquidity, uh, the global factor in asset prices, the global factor in, uh, in capital flows. There's some effect in the commodity, also on the commodity price index um, and, and, oh, and the, uh, the exchange rate as well and on VIX. So if we look at the financial variables, we see that we have pretty much strong responses here uh, when we have a US monetary policy tightening. Now, uh, this is the same uh, style of uh, impulse responses that I'm showing you, showing you still from the US monetary policy tightening. The only thing that is changing here is that we have decomposed uh, capital flows into uh, flows into and out of the US and flows into and out of emerging markets. And you see that uh, inflows to the US and outflow from the US both go down when there is a US monetary policy tightening. But there's an asymmetric effect for the emerging markets where you have inflows going down and also outflows going up. So this is uh, the vulnerability of emerging markets here that shows up quite, uh, quite clearly to US monetary policy tightening. So that's for the US side. So as we've seen, there is uh, a lot happening on financial, international financial market transmission. 
uh, not so much on the uh, real side of things, some, but, but it's not the, the first um, style of transmission that comes from the data. Now, we are looking at uh, Chinese monetary policy uh, in a similar fashion, except that, of course, unfortunately for China, we don't have uh, the equivalent of Fed futures for the RMB, so we cannot uh, use the instrument or the nice identification strategy based on the uh, uh, futures uh, instrumental variable. So we have to uh, do something which is a little bit uh, less sophisticated. We are uh, using a recursive identification in which we're going to assume that some variables are slow moving. Uh, the Chinese monetary policy indicator that we are using is taken from Xu and Jia. It's uh, using, making use of a lot of uh, different monetary policy tools that the People's Bank of China uses uh, and uses with different uh, intensity at different uh, points in time. The variables are going to be similar to what we have uh, looked at for, uh, for the United States. Uh, and we are going to now see uh, how Chinese monetary policy um, transmits. So here again, we are going to, uh, to look at uh, 100 basis points um, shock to the Chinese monetary policy index, which corresponds to a pretty big two standard deviation shock uh, to that index. And we are going to look at uh, the transmission on uh, the uh, real variables here. And you can see that there is a lot going on here, of course, on the uh, on, on, on the real variables, uh, that's uh, going to be that's for China. You have um, uh, the uh, exchange rate as well here, which is uh, which is moving. You have the, the consumer uh, prices in China also, which is uh, reacting. But what is very interesting is that if you look at the financial condition, there's not much happening. The world financial conditions, unlike what we saw in the US, you don't see much. The global factor in asset prices is not moving much. Uh, the global factor in capital flows, uh, a little with delay maybe. Uh, the VIX is not reacting at all like it did for a US monetary policy. On the other hand, what is moving quite a lot is the commodity price index here. Uh, world trade is reacting and the world production is reacting. And so that's five. 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 Okay, thank you, Larry. So uh, there seems to be a pretty different pattern of, uh, of transmission uh, compared to the transmission of uh, US monetary policy. So uh, here, again, if we, uh, uh, we look at uh, different variables uh, for, the US, for the Chinese monetary policy shock, uh, we try to zoom in a little bit more maybe on the commodity uh, producer country. Uh, what we look at are the inflows into commodity producer, outflows from commodity uh, producer, and also private liquidity of commodity producers. And you see that they are affected quite a bit by, um, uh, by uh, Chinese monetary policy shocks here, together with, as we have already seen, the commodity price index. If we look at uh, the world production again here, the world trade, so here we have stronger actually responses than we previously had. And we zoom in also on, uh, on Germany because Germany uh, is very connected in trade with, uh, with China. So in the network, the trade network, uh, China and, uh, and Germany have, uh, have quite strong links. And indeed we see that a, a tightening in China has uh, pretty uh, sizable effects on imports and exports in Germany and on industrial production in Germany. So um, to conclude, I think uh, what, um, uh, what we find so far is that by running this, um, for the moment, separate um, VRs with uh, US monetary policy on one side and the Chinese monetary policy on the other side, is that uh, there are pretty different style of, uh, of transmission uh, for uh, US monetary policy and Chinese monetary policy. The US monetary policy uh, seems to transmit uh, mainly through um, uh, global uh, international financial markets. So we see its effects on the global factor in asset prices, 
uh, on the global capital flow factor, uh, also on, on the VIX and on other measures of, uh, of risk aversion. It's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty clear. While Chinese monetary policy seems uh, to uh, transmit itself a lot more through uh, commodity uh, prices and also through trade links and, uh, and, trans and transmits also through uh, to industrial production uh, more generally. And in particular, we have seen a very strong effects also on, on, on Germany uh, through trade links. Uh, now, uh, <laughs> what we have also seen is that there's a bit of an asymmetry of transmission if we look at advanced economy and, uh, and emerging markets in the sense that emerging markets seems to be vulnerable both on the financial side and on the trade side, because on the financial side, we've seen that uh, a tightening on, on, uh, on the US side uh, leads to um, both a decrease in inflow and an increase in outflows. So it's also the case for commodity producers uh, with a Chinese uh, monetary policy shock, but also emerging markets are vulnerable through commodity prices and trade. Um, so uh, so there's, a, there's a fragility there, which is a bit asymmetric, it seems, uh, between emerging markets and advanced economies. Now, the next step of, of, uh, of this paper is to uh, try to uh, integrate essentially the two, uh, the, the, the dynamics, the joint dynamics of, uh, of our countries by uh, going to a global, to, uh, to a GVAR, uh, following uh, some work by uh, Chida Bianchi, Pesaran, and co -offer. And uh, the beauty of, uh, of doing GVARs is that uh, we should be able to uh, uh, account for network structures, uh, interlinkages of the economies, both uh, looking at the financial side, the financial network that I've shown you, or the trade networks, and also by uh, uh, using uh, different weights computed at different moments, uh, we can actually have a view on the evolution of network structures and how they affect transmission of shocks uh, when the financial networks were maybe not as developed uh, and, uh, and, and, when they, uh, and now where economies are fairly integrated. So this is uh, where this paper is going. We're not quite there yet, but we are, we are working on it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helene. Um, we, have, we don't have much time uh, to have a discussion, um, though I'm very, very glad that, that Pat sent out an invitation for people. But is there anything that people, anyone would like to raise right now in the five minutes that we have? I mean, maybe I could ask a question of Helen. Um, uh, I think these interests, it's very interesting, the uh, very interesting information that you showed. I'm just wondering how, I don't think you have in mind that US monetary policy shocks or monetary policy shocks are that important. It's just that we know more about how to identify them than other shocks. But do you have a sense of whether they, these are important like from, the, from like the US shocks, are they a big part of fluctuations or are you using them as uh, just sources of information about the transfers of shocks where you see, where you feel a little bit more confident that it's actually a monetary shock, you know, another as opposed to in other cases. Uh, no, so they are especially important because you, I mean, you could already see it in the, in the impulse responses I've shown here, in the sense that uh, when you look at the uh, uh, various measures, in fact, very many measures of uh, uh, global asset prices, uh, indices of risk aversions uh, globally, uh, which are very correlated across countries, uh, all these things, uh, the VIX. US monetary policy has a strong impact on that, but this is asymmetric. This is not the case for other countries. So here you could see China uh, didn't have the same effect on, on those uh, international financial measures. In other work, I, I could use also a similar identification strategy as in the US for the UK, because for the UK, we do have futures market <laughs> for sterling. <laughs> and, and you could see that, uh, uh, there is a big asymmetry here. So the US variables do have an effect on UK variables, despite the floating exchange rate sterling US, but it's not the case the other way around. Uh, you, uh, uh, you know, we, we, uh, there are some other pa pa papers looking, started to look at uh, ECB also, because there starts to be uh, some uh, futures um, uh, data available to do that. And uh, there are similar findings. So there is a big asymmetry. So it's uh, the US, but, but but 
What about the basic issue, which is U.S.'s monetary policy is 98% its feedback rule on whatever it feeds back on. And the way it affects the world has to be 90 some percent through its feedback rule. And the blips, the little extra blips, the highly high frequency orthogonal blips are super useful in identifying the mechanism of the blips, but they're not the way the U.S. affects the world, right? The U.S. affects the world because we feed back on what's happening and we lower rates. That won't show up as a blip, an orthogonalized blip to everything else. And that's where the action is, wouldn't you say? And then anything that, I always thought of this stuff Larry, Marty and company does is very useful for saying the pure, 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 pure hiccup that Bernanke has on his way to cross the street from what he wanted to do to what he does, orthogonal to everything else, is useful for the blips. It ain't useful to say what does monetary policy do. It's going to go down in bad times, up in good times. I mean, that's where the action is. If we're going to impact the rest of the world, it's through the comment, that piece, not through the blips. Well, so the variance decomposition of, uh, you know, this monetary policy shock, we provide them in the paper with Sylvia. So, of course, uh, there are a vast underestimation of the true effect. Uh, and yet that, uh, you know, uh, depending on the horizon, of, of course, but uh, you, you, you do explain part of the variance uh, uh, using the, the shocks. But, of course, uh, you know, uh, yes, this is, uh, this is only a part of what U.S. monetary policy does. Well, I did, did you? I didn't see a variance decomposition. What, can you can you can you say something about like percent? Uh, the, uh, what Pat called about the hiccups. The, so what so percent? it's in the, the appendix of the paper with Sylvia, which is uh, in the uh, in the Ari stud. I, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But in, in any case, I don't think that stuff is is essential. I do I do think it's important for thinking about how to interpret. Uh, the results. I think what Pat's saying about the feedback rule, you can't identify the effects of that using a VAR. So it is very interesting to see, I think, the impulse responses to the hiccups. Uh, but, but sometimes I get the feeling that maybe you, you, the, the hiccups might, I, I just wanted to verify how you interpret those hiccups, whether it's a nice, convenient clue that we're able to use to uncover the structure as opposed to whether it's really very, I mean, accounts for a large portion of the variance of the financial volatility in the world. Um, yeah, we're under sort of <laughs> under this incredible time pressure and uh, they're gonna stop this. I, I see it's 14 after the hour and they're gonna, you know, and yeah, I just got the message they're gonna they're going to uh, unceremoniously uh, chop our heads off in, in one minute. So um, I, I want to thank everyone for, the, I, for me, fascinating uh, uh, pre uh, presentations. And I wish I could join you uh, at Pat's uh, party. I don't know if he's handing out cook virtual cookies and uh, drinks, but uh, it, it's great that he's, that he's doing this. And I encourage you to go. Um, and, and uh, visit with him. So I hope it works. We just all click on this link and then we can chit chat for a while before everyone has to take off if you want. Does everyone get it? I stuck it in there twice. I stuck it in early and I stuck it in just two minutes ago. And I think you yeah. just click on this link. And then there's a password and sometimes- I don't think you, you... need the password. Ah, okay. But if but anyone some... gets screwed up, write me an email and I'll send you it directly. I send it to the panel, patrickjameskeo at gmail.com. Patrick James Keo at gmail.com and I'll send it to you directly in the email. But hopefully you just click on this thing. Yeah. Okay. I Thanks, think Larry. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, for the, thank for, you. For, for, for